Hello mortals, I am the booktube goddess, the number one drag queen booktuber on YouTube. It is time for a new book review coming right at you. Before we go on, I just want to address that yes, this is a real fur coat. It was given to me by a very dear friend, but it is a vintage coat that's a hundred years old and I don't support the fur industry these days, but I also don't have a problem with uh, a vintage coat. <laughs> so apologies if you are offended. Otherwise, let's get on with the video because I have read The Gollum and the Genie by Helene Wexler and its sequel, The Hidden Palace. I've heard so much about this book, beginning with an Omegle recommendation. All right, there is the uh, the golem and the jenny. It's kind of a wholesome book about this, um, uh, well, a golem and a jenny that kind of meet and they do their thing. That makeup. What was I thinking? Also, some of my viewers on my live stream have recommended this book, so I finally decided to pick it up, and now I understand what the buzz has been about. The Gullum and the Genie was published in 2013 and took Helene Wexler seven years to research and write. It has been compared to Susanna Clarke's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which makes sense because that book takes seven years to read. Oh, don't take seven years to subscribe to my channel. If you aren't subscribed, go ahead and do that now. And don't forget to hit that notification bell. And everyone give this video a thumbs up. The Gullum and the Genie is mostly set in New York City during the 1890s, not a period explored much in fantasy. And obviously the author has done the research and has the writing chops to really make the setting and the time period come to life in a gritty, realistic, and immersive way. The author, Helene Wexler, has stated that she initially tried writing a story that paralleled her own marriage about two cultures clashing. She's Jewish American and her husband is Arab American. However, those stories didn't pan out so she turned her talents to writing in the genre that she loved, fantasy. For those who don't know, a golem is a mythical creature in the Hebrew culture about a guardian creature made of clay created using Kabbalistic magic, sort of a Frankenstein-like construct. A genie is, of course, a mythical creature from the Middle East an elemental creature of air and fire. Now the plot of the novel, which is in the title, involves the relationship between a gullum and a genie. The gullum in this case is in the form of a woman created to be someone's wife or someone's sex doll. But the husband wanted his gollum to be infused with curiosity intelligence, and to be proper. The genie has been trapped in a bottle for a thousand years, and both of these creatures find themselves in New York City during the turn of last century. The Gullum ends up in a poor Jewish immigrant neighborhood where everyone speaks Yiddish, and the genie finds himself in Little Syria, where Syrian immigrants have taken root. Eventually, the Gullum and the Genie meet, and the novel explores their relationship. Now, that's all I'm going to say about the plot, which honestly is rather thin as far as plots go, but this is a character-driven novel, and talking too much about the plot will take us into spoiler territory. But since this is a character-driven novel, Let's talk about the characters. The Gullum is called Chava and looks like a tall, heavy woman. However, her superhero abilities include super strength, 
not needing to eat or sleep, and unexpectedly, at least for me, the ability to read minds or to hear thoughts. She was created to be curious and intelligent, but that third aspect of her personality, being proper, really is what defines her. She is prim, modest, and very moral. There's another aspect to her which isn't clear, that it's just from her programming or her nature, but she is also very obedient. Though she is fully intelligent and aware, she is also a newborn, freshly brought to life and plopped in this strange alien world of New York in the 1890s. Since golems are not really meant to be wives or companions, they're meant to be fierce guardians and protectors, and they all have this defect that they eventually go berserk in violent killing and destroying everything around them. So Chava must constantly be on guard against running amok, against letting her own nature loose. Oh, and I also think Chava gives a great representation of asexuals, at least in this novel. The genie is called Ahmed and has not only been trapped in a bottle for a thousand years, but finds when he is released that he is trapped in human form. Genies in this world are shapeshifters and their natural form is some sort of insubstantial, invisible whirlwind. They are amoral and roam the deserts in the Middle East. So Ahmed is in severe culture shock in little Syria. Now he has superpowers too. He has super strength and he can control and summon fire. And his weakness is water. Water is his kryptonite that can even kill him if he's not careful, which makes rain and snow a little problematic. Genies also are susceptible to iron, but Ahmed doesn't have this disadvantage because he is bound to human form by iron, so iron doesn't affect him. He's used to being a free spirit. Now, since he's used to being a free spirit, he is also extremely arrogant. So as you can imagine, these two creatures are somewhat antithetical to each other, especially when you take into account they come from two completely different cultures. The standout in this novel, I think, is the writing. It is beautifully written. The details and insights bring life to New York during the 1890s. In fact, the research and the particulars brought out in this novel could classify it, I think, as historical fiction, at least in my opinion. Now, it is also written in third-person omniscient, which is not seen very often these days and not well done when you do see it, but the Gullum and the Genie makes some of the best use of this narration style that I've seen in modern fiction in a long time. Usually writing today is either first person or third person limited. In third person limited, the point of view is strictly from one character's viewpoint. In omniscient third person, the narration, while usually focused on one character, can dip into the thoughts and motivations of side characters. It reminds me of something in one of Kurt Vonnegut's novels, and I forget which one. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you know what I'm talking about. But Vonnegut vowed not to overlook any minor character, but to give them all full lives in his book. So not only do we have a detailed focus on our two main characters, but we have a host of other characters too. There's the man who wants Shava as his wife, the mystic who created Shava for him, the rabbi who finds Shava and befriends her, the rabbi's nephew, a Jewish baker, his wife, their employees, <laughs> the Syrian immigrant who is a metalsmith who releases Ahmed, and the woman who owns a bottle that has Ahmed trapped, and this woman owns a coffee shop in Little Syria along with her husband, 
There's a man that sells ice cream on the streets in Little Syria. There's this upper class debutante who lives in Park Avenue where Ahmed explores. We get to intimately know each of the supporting cast of characters, which further enriches the story and deepens our understanding of the setting. Now, this brings us to one of the weaknesses I found in the novel, that there are so many characters that are getting prime time narration and backstories. There were parts of the novel for me where it felt like nothing was going anywhere. But what the author is doing is setting everyone up in place like pieces on a chessboard. Have to admit, as a reader, I often felt wondering, where are we going with this? This leads us to the other weakness. It was hard at times to see what the overarching stakes were, the major complication in the novel which is a basic element of storytelling. There were small complications that drove the story forward, but where was the villain? By the way, there is an actual villain in the novel, but that villain is in the background through much of the novel and we aren't aware of the stakes. But as I was reading, I realized that the real complication, the real villain, if you will, was loneliness born of being the other. Both Chav and Ahmed are literally aliens among humans, not able to relate, but having a deep need to get close to those around them because there's nobody else. Even in their cultural enclaves in New York, they don't feel a part of those communities. Of course, as readers, anyone who has ever felt alienated even among people in your own culture or family can relate to what is going on with the Gollum and the Genie. In the end, the author delivers. All the moving of the chess pieces come together to a satisfying conclusion, and none of the minor characters are superfluous. Now, I will say there is a strong tendency for the author to use coincidences to tie up ends, but I felt everything was justified. The writing and the non-traditional plotting puts this in the category of literary fiction, so I would not be surprised to find this shelved under general fiction rather than in fantasy and science fiction in some bookstores. Of course, I give The Gollum and the Genie by Helene Wexler my blessing. I found myself not able to put the book down and immediately picked up the sequel, The Hidden Palace. Now, the writing style in The Hidden Palace was of the same quality and detail, and as was the research into the time period in New York. This time it's from around 1900 to 1915, the early 20th century. I don't want to talk too much about the sequel, since I don't want to go into spoilers for the first book, but just to say it picks up after the events of the first novel. The narration is again third person omniscient, and we get another large cast of characters, many of whom we met in the first novel. However, the weaknesses I found in The Gollum and the Genie were much more evident in the sequel. In my opinion, I felt the lack of a major complication and the lack of a villain, to be honest, was much more problematic here. To me, it felt like the chess pieces kept shuffling around well past the midpoint of the book without giving direction to the story. Also, the use of coincidence to tie characters together was much more pronounced to the point where I was saying, really? Really? But the writing kept me going and I felt satisfied by the ending. I also give the sequel, The Hidden Palace, my blessing. But in my opinion, the sequel was not as good as the first book. I gave The Hidden Palace four stars on Goodreads and The Gollum and the Genie a well-deserved five stars. If you have read either of these novels, let me know what you thought of them in the comments. If you haven't read them, let me know in the comments if you plan to. 
Until we meet again, may all the books you read be blessed.